Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Um, beautiful day today. Is it wonderful outside? Yeah? <laughs> Do you enjoy it? You know, last week it was raining, and we're like, oh, come on, you know, no more rain. You know, like almost 50 days of rain, and then, you know, all of a sudden, just, you know, starting from a couple of days ago, it started, you know, sunlight, beautiful sunlight. You know, I went to the beach. I mean, I didn't go swimming, but I went to the beach side, and then, you know, people are out there. It looked really wonderful. And then now I'm hearing people say, it's too hot. <laughs> Man, you know, heavy rain, hurricanes come. But then there are better days, like today. And, you know, whatever that you're going through in your life, the storms of life, I pray that God will provide you with this beautiful sunlight and that he will restore you, recover you, heal you from whatever the situations that you may be in. And with that, uh, today we're going to continue on with uh, the storms of life. Uh, the title of my message is Hope in the Midst of the Storm. Uh, last week we talked about storms of life, that there are storms, inevitably there are storms in life, um, whether we like it or not. But then in those storms we face our limitations and it's really difficult for us to overcome and win those storms that come right at us. But then the good news was what? As Jesus comes right into our, the storm and said, it is I, do not be afraid. We have Jesus Christ who can make us overcome those storms. And he will heal us. He will make us whole. He will give us strength. And we praise Jesus for that. Amen? Yeah. And so today, I want to continue on talking about the storm, but, you know, a little bit of, of shift of our focus. Uh, last, you know, uh, two weeks ago, I did uh, briefly mention, like, you know, why then um, is the storm in our life? And so we're going to talk about why and how to understand and interpret the storms of life. Philip Yancey uh, wrote a book called the question that never goes away. The question that never, never goes away. What is the question? Why? <laughs> right? What's the question? Why? Why do these bad things happen? Why is there so much suffering? Why does such good God allow such bad things to happen in our lives? Why am I going through this? You know, we all want to know the purpose and we want to know the reason behind what is happening in our lives. And so we constantly ask this question, why? Why is God allowing this pain in my life? Where is God uh, in this? And we want to have the answer to all things and we want to find out why. In today's passage, and we're going to read it, it's going to be from John chapter 9, verse 1 through 11. In today's passage, we see disciples asking Jesus about this blind man sitting and begging. And so I'm going to read it first. So turn to John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. I'll read it. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that the, he was born blind? Jesus answered, it is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made a mud with the saliva, and then he anointed this, the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. 
Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were you, your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. This is word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So again, we see in our passage today, disciples asking Jesus, you know, about this blind man uh, sitting and begging. Going back to verse 2, he asked, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he is born blind? In other words, there must be something There, there, you know, there must be someone who did something very wrong or very bad that this man is blind. New Living Translation translates, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sin? And this was a you know, common thinking process because in those days, it was common for people to automatically think of sickness as a result of active sin. So you're sick, then you've done something wrong. And obviously, this man you know, who is blind, but you know, born blind, and they're a little bit confused, I guess. So, you know, his baby and born blind, meaning like, did it sin as he was coming out or, you know, so, or then is it the parents who sin? And so why is this man blind? Um, so, you know, Jesus, you're the wise one, let us know. You know, like, we see people not only want to know why, right, like, why is this happening, but they are so interested in other people's business, right? Yeah. I don't know. People are curious and they want to know the reason of why you are going through such a thing, why you are suffering. And maybe they want to provide with answer. Oh, let me tell you why. And actually, that's something that you see in Book of Job. You know, his so-called friends, in, you know, it, it interprets Job's suffering. And they say, Job chapter 8, 3, does God pervert justice? Or does the mighty pervert the right? Five and six. If you will seek God and plead with the mighty for mercy, you, you, if you are pure and upright, surely then he will arouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. They are saying, you know, why would God allow your suffering unless you've done something wrong? So in that sense, repent. Ask for mercy so that he will forgive you. <laughs> you know, if you read through Job, like, you, you're like, wow, what are these, uh, how could they, uh, how do we even call them three friends, right? Like, where's the love? But isn't it true for, even for us today? You know, just like the disciples, you know, who are curious and asking, like, what's wrong with this guy? What did he do wrong? Or is it his parents? Or just like, you know, Job's three friends. Oh, you know, there must be a reason why you're suffering. You must have done something wrong. You should repent, you know. We are curious about what's happening around us today. And we want to start, what? Finding out whys. Finding out the reason. We want to know why, and maybe we want to go tell people, you know, why things are happening the way it is. Do you remember, like, uh, last year, December, when the corona hit China, and then, like, it was kind of going, um, like, crazy? I hear from people here and there, and even Christians making comments. Well, mostly Christians that I heard was like, well, now China is being punished, right? They've been persecuting Christians and you know, the communism and all of that, and then blah, blah, blah. And so now God is finally punishing China, praise the Lord, kind of thing. And then what? It jumped to United States. 
And then now people are saying, oh, finally the judgment is on the United States. Why? Because they love of money, the capitalism, and, you know, all of that. You know, they took out Bible from their, you know, public schools. And, you know, they're going on and on and with that. And they're, you know, saying that's why God is punishing the United States. And how about Italy? How about Brazil? How about Korea? You know, at the end of the day, you know what you're doing? especially with this corona, if you're interpreting the corona, you're literally judging and pointing fingers to every country <laughs> and saying, God is judging. God is, you know, condemning. God is, you know, pouring his wrath on all these, you know, um, countries. Is this true? Is God punishing all these countries and pouring out His wrath? Who can confidently say, yes, He is? Or who could confidently say, no, He's not? How can we be sure? How do we know? Why does God allow this pandemic? Is it God's punishment of all human race? And he's saving those people who've been doing good and, you know, they've been worshiping God. And so, you know, are we free from that, that coronavirus and he's protecting us? Not an easy answer. Why God is allowing your suffering? Do you think it's because you've done something wrong before God? Do you feel like you have done something wrong and he hates you and he now he's punishing you? And is that why you're suffering? Or you've been asking those questions, why? Why, Lord? Why, God? Again, the problem is answers are not always easy to come by. And many times, God is silent in our suffering. And even if he were to speak, he doesn't always give us the answer that we want or, you know, he, he doesn't give us the answer that we're asking for. In fact, in our passage today, look, verse 3 and 4, you know, when disciples ask that question, like, whose sin is it? Guess what Jesus says? Verse 4 and 5, I'll read it. Jesus answered. Well, thank God that, you know, Jesus is there and answering. And this is what he answers. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus answered them, you know, saying it's not a matter of sin. Rather, he, you know, he is blind so that the works of God might be displayed through him. Wait, now we have a new perspective here, right, in understanding suffering or pain. In all life situations and circumstances, there is something for God's work to be done. Jesus doesn't answer disciples' questions, but he says there is something to be done. We don't know why things are happening the way it is, but in the midst of suffering and circumstances, there is something God is going to do. Well, what is the work of God that Jesus is saying here? What is Jesus talking about? Well, we know from you know, reading the scripture, on one hand, it is clear that the work of God in our particular passage, in the particular situation, that Jesus was giving sight to this blind man. But that's not all there is, right? This man receiving his sight was symbolic of the work of God that Jesus Christ came to do. John 1, 9 says, When all are living in darkness, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. 
when everyone was living in darkness, we are all like this blind man, not seeing, not understanding, you know, living our every single day uh, life, but not knowing who we are, where we're going, where we're headed, lost, not knowing who created us, not knowing what purpose we're living for, struggling so hard to live this life, to find happiness, to find love, to find contentment, to find a meaning and purpose. We go after it. We run, you know, with all our might. But really, what are we living for? Why are we fighting through each wave of suffering and of pain and injustice, trying to make through? For what? Why are you working so hard? For what? What are you living for? Where are you going? Can you answer that? And you feel like, whoa, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm headed. I am lost. Well, yeah. That was the situation, spiritually speaking, not physical blindness, but, you know, we're all living in darkness. And Jesus is saying, I am here to make you see. There's a job that I need to do, and I am here to open your eyes. I am here to make you understand, to make sure you're on the right path. And how am I going to do that? I am the light of the world. John 1, 4 says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He's saying, I am the light of the world. (laughs) Are you guys following me? Because here you, you, you see disciples asking, you know, with this theological question, right? Like, who sinned that this man is blind? Like, who, who did something wrong here? What's going on? Whose fault is it? <laughs> and then standing right beside him, Jesus is saying what? I am the light of the world. Okay, (laughs) Jesus, where's the connection, right? Well, what do you mean? You know, as I was preparing for the message today and thinking of, you know, the storms of life, the sufferings of life, and, you know, all these things that's happening around the world, and, you know, I I spent some time reading through Job because, you know, Book of Job is like the go-to book, right, when when talking about suffering and things like that. and you know what? I saw the same pattern in the account of, uh, account of the life of Job. You know, Job was a righteous man, and you see God so, you know, proud of this, his servant Job. And yet all these troubles and all this pain, all these crazy things happened to him, and God allowed these difficulties to happen to him. And, you know, when hardship came to him, Job, you know, like his the entire book is about just wrestling through, like what's going on, what is happening? He doesn't understand and is asking why. And of course, his friends come and start to you know, give, explain what was happening. Again, like what a wonderful friends, right? <laughs> but after all this conversation and reasoning and wrestling, finally God comes to him and begins to speak. And instead of giving him the answer, God lays out all the works that he is doing. In fact, this is the longest single speech by God in the Bible. And here, like, you know, he has a perfect opportunity to answer Job's question and tell him what is going on, why things happened the way it happened. And, you know, like, he could have explained himself, but, you know, he didn't explain any of that. He didn't go and touch upon the question, why? Instead... (laughs) It's like, hey, let's talk about my role and your role. And my role is to run the universe. And let me tell you briefly what I do, right? 
verse 30, uh, chapter 38 of Job, and I'm going to just read it. And I, you know, I pray that you just hear and try to understand, like, wow, this is what God is doing. Okay? And just think of it as like God is standing in front of you and is just explaining to you. And maybe, you know, your situation, your suffering, what are you going through? I don't know. And you're asking why. And then you come today, God, why? And then this is what God's going to tell you. Um, let's just read it. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm going to ask you a question. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? And on, on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light, and where is this place of darkness that you may take it into its territory, and that you may discern the path into its home? You know, for you were born then, and then the number of your days is, is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle or war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Jump to verse 34. Can you lift up your voice to the, to the clouds that the flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward part or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skin of the heavens? When the dust runs into a mass and the cloth stick fast together. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? When they crouch in their dens or lie in the wade in their thicket? Who provides for the ravens' its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wonder about, wonder about for lack of food? And then, you know, it's going to continue on in chapter 39. And, you know, please go home and read this entire chapter line by line. It sounds like, do you know who I am? You know, he's giving this answer, and this is what I get. And I'm like, do you know what I can do? Do you know what my role is? And then it says, your role is to simply trust me that I know what I am doing. Even if it doesn't make sense to you, trust me that I know what I am doing. I feel like that's what God is saying. <laughs> And then, of course, you go to Isaiah 55, 8, 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I know what I am doing. And with that, you go over to chapter 42 after hearing God giving him answer. In fact, the questioning him, were you there? Were you there? Do you know what's happening here and there? And you know what Job said? Chapter 42, 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the, uh, of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job finally understands God doesn't have to give us answer. He doesn't have to explain himself. In fact, all we got to do is simply trust him. We need to have faith in the one who created, who oversees, who knows every breath of man, who controls the heavens and the earth. The, when the sun rises and the sun falls, when the tides come in and out, you know how the star shines in the darkness and then in the moon and in its place. <laughs> if God is holding this universe in his hands, we turn to him and say, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to deal with the situation, but I trust you and that you are doing something and that you are great. And this is exactly what Jesus did in our passage today. And this is exactly what Jesus did when he came down to this earth. He did not go around and explain all the suffering the people were going through. And, you know, people, you know, were asking questions. And didn't, Jesus didn't go, you know, uh, to a person at a time and try to explain why you're suffering, why things are happening the way it is. He's not interpreting, you know, the situations. But we see Jesus <laughs> who is, right? I am, Right? What's happening here? I am the light of the world. Who is in, it, in his perfect nature responds with compassion, comfort, and healing, and he's there, and he, is, he, wants to, he wants to make us know who he is. Because when we understand him, when we get to know him, when we, in, in all of him, when we grasp who this amazing Jesus is, we will respond like Job. Like, I will worship you. <laughs> I trust you. Because you see, when the apostles and everyone else saw sickness in this man, it's like pointing fingers probably, right? Like, you've, you have sinned. Jesus saw the person. When everyone saw a theological problem, so is it his parents or him? Jesus saw the pain and suffering this man was going through. When people were pointing fingers at, this, you know, at his parents, maybe, Jesus reached out. He reached out his hand and anointed the man's eyes. When they were only concerned with getting the answer, the, the reason why and all of that, Jesus sought to deliver the person. And isn't that what Jesus exactly came here to do? In the midst of darkness, in our suffering, to shine light in darkness, to give light to those who are blinded, to take us out of our darkness into his marvelous light, to deliver us out of sin and death, to give us forgiveness and eternal life. And for that reason, when people were mocking him, punching him, he stayed silent and he carried that cross. One went up the Calvary. He took all our sins. He bore our sins, carried it to the cross, and died for us. In the midst of storm, right through the storm, he comes and he walks on water a couple of weeks ago, 
right? To be with us in the storm, in our midst, calling us out to not fear, not to worry. And he says, why? It is I. I am here, so don't worry. No matter what life throws at us, no matter the suffering and pain we go through for a short while that we are here on earth, you know, we will able to make it through because He is here with us, God with us. And that's what He's saying. I am the light of the world. And in that, we have hope because we know that He has already secured us and the future that we lo- look forward to is the future of never-ending glory, never-ending joy. We're united with God forever, the Creator, you know, with us forever. That's the hope we have. And until then, He holds us in His hands. He holds the whole world in His hands. And and though we might not see it completely, though we might not understand it completely, though our pains and difficult situations make it feel like there's not an answer, no hope, but we say, no, God is in control. He is doing something in our suffering. He's not going to explain to you why you're suffering. Well, maybe he, he may. But one thing we know for sure is that He is there with us in our suffering. So dear brothers and sisters, what are you going through in life right now? And are you asking that question, why? And are you trying to make sense of it all? And are you trying to interpret the things that's happening around us? I pray that you hear this message today that Jesus is saying, I am here for you. I am the light of the world. I am your only hope. You know, as I was preparing for this message, you know, it's just back of my mind, there was this heavy burden, you know, because honestly, I don't fully understand your struggles. Um, because I haven't personally experienced, you know, each of your situations. I cannot fully know what it's like to walk in your shoes, to, to go through sufferings, of physical pain, or, you know, loss of loved ones, or you know, losing of your job and, you know, just you're locked down here in, in, you know, in the third country and you don't know when you could go back. You know, like, and I don't know what you're going through. And I was worried and, and, you know, praying that this sermon today wouldn't just come across to you, you know, just like the, uh, you know, the Job's three friends giving you the answer, the giving you the theological correct answer, right? I didn't want to come up here and then, and, and, you know, not being able to understand your suffering and give you a lecture on suffering. Like, Lord, that's the last thing that I want to do. Here I am proclaiming that God is in control and Jesus is here for you. And yet, you know, what if in your mind you're thinking, like, what do you know? So all this week, seriously, I was really praying, Lord, I know and I believe that you are in control. And I believe that you are here for us in our suffering today. And may, many of our congregation are going through such difficulties these days. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, can you come and minister to each one's heart and speak to them? Restore them, comfort them, protect them, and give them confidence that yes, that God 
is in control. May this not be a time where with my short understanding and with my mouth that I try to explain. Help me not to be like the friends of Job or like disciples, you know, asking those questions, trying to answer, trying to give you, I'm the pastor, I should know the answer, and here you go. Help me not to do that, that you, but you go today in everyone's life. Minister to them in their hearts. So, dear brothers and sisters, as I close and praise him, please come up. I pray that you hear his voice today. I pray that you experience this Jesus in your life today because he is at work and he is in control. Because when you hold Jesus and when you hear his voice, once again, when you actually do hear his voice, everything solved. (laughs) Situation still may be the same, but in your heart, peace. When the world is going all crazy and who knows, we might go back to online worship next week, (laughs) right? Who knows? Who knows? But believe that Jesus is, is, Jesus is in this pandemic. He's doing something around the world right at this time, doing something amazing. Maybe we don't know, and we may never be able to kind of point out all the reasons why. But let's trust in the Lord and believe that He is in control and He holds the universe together. And if He were to pour out His wrath on us, <laughs> no one can stand. No one is here today. Just like, you know, David says in Psalm 130, you know, who can stand <laughs> in the presence of you when you pour out your wrath? <laughs> but there is hope in the Lord. And we wait upon him. Like the watchman waits for the morning. Like the watchman waits for the morning. We wait in hope. So with that, I would like to uh, invite you to sing with me and proclaim the song that there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Whatever the situation that you're mind in, When you meet Jesus, when you hear His voice, it's good enough. It's good enough. So there's power. And I pray that you experience His anointing, His presence.